Welcome to day three of the Middle East. Uh, today, uh, we're going to continue kind of where we left off with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and in order to introduce you to uh, the Intifada, I am going to read a short uh, description about uh, the culminating events of the Intifada, uh, which is taken from uh, Peter Ackerman's uh, <clears throat> study of uh, nonviolent uh, methods called a force more powerful. It's called the Intifada Campaign for a Homeland, a shaking off. The rain fell steadily as Hanan Aruri and other Palestinian students came together in the fog and chill on the campus of Berzi University one morning in December 1987. Joined by people from the surrounding area of the Israeli-occupied West Bank, Dozens soon grew to hundreds, and then hundreds became a thousand. By midday, demonstrators thronged the campus and adjoining streets of Birzit village. The protest had hastily been called amid news from the Gaza Strip, the smaller occupied territory on the Mediterranean coast, that four Palestinians had been killed when an Israeli truck driver crashed into their vans at a military checkpoint. Rumors spread that it was not an incident sorry, that it was not an accident, but rather an act of vengeance for the recent slaying of an Israeli by a Palestinian. What seemed strange to Aruri was not that so many people, most under the age of 30, had shown up on a such a gloomy day, but that the Israeli Defense Forces, or IDF, in charge of policing the West Bank, had, yet, had not yet come to disperse them. The soldiers were never far from Burzi or the nearby town of Ramallah where Ruri lived, and such an assembly was illegal under the regulations of the civil administration that ran the Palestinian populated territories occupied by Israel. Waiting in the wet, surreal calm, Ruri and her friends felt a confrontation coming on. It was not until shortly after dark, about five o'clock or six o'clock, that they filtered into the village through a warren of streets and alleys. Clad in their green commando uniforms and black desert boots and brandishing Galilee automatic rifles, they started clearing the crowds by firing rubber bullets. Past demonstrations had always been dissipated with a rapid conclusive show of force. Never during the 20 years of occupation had Palestinians not eventually backed down. As the protesters scattered, soldiers closed off the town's exit roads. Dozens of Palestinians were rounded up and arrested, but even more stood their ground and hurled stones. Scuffling went on until almost 11 o'clock as the remaining demonstrators ran off into the hills, eventually to find their way home. Aruri was not hurt or arrested, but the day was seared in her memory. It was one of the first episodes of what was soon to become the Intifada, the Arabic word for a shaking off the largest uprising of Palestinians ever in the occupied territories. 30 miles to the southeast of Berzi in the porous rundown Gaza Strip, Palestinians there were reacting to the tragedy at the military checkpoint. Riots broke out in refugee camps and villages and soon spread to the West Bank. Without the guidance of any well-known leaders, Palestinian youngsters, boys and girls alike, confronted the IDF soldiers in the streets. Some were too young to have thrown stones in anger before, let alone understood what it meant. But with every rock let loose went some of the frustration that Palestinians had long felt about the Israeli occupation. The images of Palestinian teenagers in the street clashes with one of the most sophisticated armies, one of the most sophisticated armies in the world, were irresistible to two television news shows around the world. It was called the Shepherd's War, in which a modern army was squaring off against civilians using the only weapons at hand, rocks, tires, and jeering taunts. The foreign press flooded to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and in the three months after the outbreak of the Intifada, more time was given to the story by the three major nightly news uh, television shows than any other including the summit meeting between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. Most of this coverage highlighted graphic scenes of the violence that spilled out during the uprising. Less well reported was a transformation in the outlook of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians for whom the occupation had felt degrading. 
Beneath the rolling surface, away from the stereotyped scenes of rocks heaved at the soldiers who struck back with tear gas, was a steadier action of Palestinians who worked against the occupation without using violence by trying to make the Palestinian community less dependent on Israel. The Intifada was a pivotal point in the struggle of the Palestinians to achieve self-rule, and violence often intruded on those who sought to make a movement from it. Yet the Intifada's impact on the events stem more from the work of Palestinians who never raised a fist. So what were the grievances of the Palestinians? Uh, many worked and paid taxes in Israel, but had no say in the government, no voting rights. Uh, there was the military rules in the Palestinian territories, uh, curfews, searches, detainments, arrests, censorship, harassment, humiliation, no right to assemble, right? You, we, you heard me read about that, that their assembly was illegal. Um, basically, in one word, it was oppression. Although the movement tried to remain nonviolent, it was about 50% nonviolent. By 1991, uh, 1,000 Palestinians had died, uh, in part because of the Israelis answering with violence as well. Uh, the Palestinian territories did become independent and attempts at democratic elections were held to national offices. So the West Bank is now controlled by Fatah leaders, um, initially by Yasser Arafat, but others since his death in 2004. Hamas leaders rule Gaza, and Hamas is another one of those groups that fell under the umbrella of the uh, PLO, which was much more militant uh, than even Fatah was. And the U.S. has uh, categorized uh, Hamas as a terrorist group. Uh, many attempts at peace have started and stopped, of course. Um, we've had the Oslo Agreements, for example, in 1993, and you have all these famous pictures of, you know, Israelis and Palestinian leaders, you know, shaking hands on the White House lawn, uh, first with President uh, Bush the senior, and then with President Clinton. Uh, you know, you've had all these moments or these attempts at, at peace that seem like they're going somewhere and they seem real positive, and then all it takes is just one little skirmish, one little tit for tat kind of violent act, like the one that started the Intifada, um, and you know things just just go away. Any peace deals uh, get severed. So <clears throat> we know that the violence has continued; it continues to this day. And although most of the world recognizes Palestine as a sovereign nation, um, the UN has not given them full recognition. Uh, they have not given them voting rights, for example, um, but the Palestinians definitely have observer status. Uh, they also, um, you know, the, the modern problem is continued because there's a lot of now um, Israeli settlements, people, Israeli people are moving into the Palestinian territories. Um, so it's actually gotten even worse uh, since, in some ways, uh, since, you know, the Palestinians have somewhat established themselves as, as a sovereign nation. The other problem, of course, is that you have Gaza and you have West Bank, and they're both being ruled by different leaders, and they're not really a unified country per se. So, you know, theoretically, like, we should have, you know, the country of Gaza and maybe the country of, of West Bank and, and you know, um, have them be two separate entities, because, of course, they're separated geographically with Israel smack dead in the middle of them. Uh, so it makes things logistically kind of odd. Um, and, and of course, we know that the violence is just just so, so pervasive there. Uh, next, you will watch The Road to 9-11, uh, movie scenes 7 through 11, the last of these. Uh, scene 7 deals with uh, the question um, or the, the status of uh, liquid gold or oil. Um, so that is one of our chief political developments that it's going to deal with specifically. Um, eight is going to deal with the Iranian revolution, um, which is where we, uh, we see, you know, for the first time in the modern world, uh, a very conservative government coming to power uh, under Ayatollah Khomeini um, and, and ushering in his Islamic revolution. Um, number nine, scene nine, is um, Egypt. Uh, so it picks up the story essentially um, after Nasser dies, he leads his he leaves uh, Anwar Sadat in charge, and Sadat 
um, is then assassinated. So it gets into you know some questions about why Sadat is assassinated. Um, scenes 10 and 11 will discuss Osama bin Laden, um, and and then they make some predictions for the future of the Middle East. Um, keep in mind that the movie was made um, in uh, I believe 2005. Um, and Osama bin Laden was still alive at that point. Um, so the one thing that is kind of interesting about watching the end of um, this movie is that um, one, they're, they're going to you know refer to Osama bin Laden in the present tense versus past tense, which is no big deal. Other than that, the information is still perfectly um, <laughs> legitimately uh, up to date. Um, but uh, the other interesting fact about watching this this uh, film is the end of this film is they make some predictions about like what's going to happen in the Middle East once Osama bin Laden has been gotten rid of and Al Qaeda has been defeated. And so it's kind of interesting because some of what they predict in that in that, you know, in their last that last bit of, of, of you know, the experts talking about <clears throat> what's going to happen. You know, we can say, yeah, they were right about this or they were wrong about this. And so that's kind of cool um, because obviously a lot's happened in the Middle East between 2005 and, and 2020. That was 15 years ago. Um, although for old farts like me, it seems like it was just yesterday. Um, so uh, happy watching the movie.